Hello everyone, my name is Laura. You're watching the Beanbird 2 channel where we talk about testimonies and the goodness of God. And today I want to talk about Adam and Eve and also Job and do a little compare contrast kind of thing. Um, so this morning I read in the news that there was a rogue wave that hit the shore of Ventura Beach in California, uh, Ventura County, California. And that rogue wave had come ashore and caused a lot of damage. And um, they were just talking about the, the power of the ocean and how this wave had been unexpected to a lot of people who were in the street around that area. And when I heard that story in the news, the first thing that I thought about was Job 38, when God talks about how he sets the boundaries of the ocean waters. And so I wanted to look that up and read that passage and just fully appreciate um, how God set the parameters for the whole world, and in this case, the ocean, and that God is in control of all of these things. And as I was reading that per little verse of Job, I was recalling how as a, a newer believer, when I was younger and immature in the faith, I didn't really understand uh, the book of Job very much. I remember feeling like, wow, Job went through all this difficult stuff and it seems like God was so harsh with him. I don't really understand why God was so harsh. And now I wanted to come at the angle of showing how the book of Job shows how God is good. And every book of the Bible points to the goodness of God. And so we can see that in any story. But I want to highlight in the book of Job how we can show that and know that God is good. And the book of Job really does highlight the majesty and the awesomeness of God, his perfect wisdom, his uh, power, understanding, and greatness is beyond human comprehension. And that's really what that whole chapter in 38 shows us is that we can trust in the Lord, humble ourselves before the Lord, and that we can trust in his perfect wisdom and understanding because it's beyond what we can understand or imagine. So first, I want to start with Adam and Eve. When we look at the story of Adam and Eve, they knew right away that they had sinned against God when they ate the fruit from the tree of knowledge. And we can know this because when the Lord came to walk with them, they responded by hiding and they hid because they knew that they had done wrong. Um, and so I think it's interesting that the way the Lord reacts and responds to them is through asking a series of questions. And when I was reading through, I wrote down all the things that God said in that interaction. And the first thing that God said is, where are you? And then the next question was, who told you you were naked? And then they respond. And then God follows up with a third question. Have you eaten from the tree I told you not to eat? And then finally, God asks, what is this that you have done? So when God asked these questions to Adam and Eve, he's really giving them grace and space to respond, confess, and repent in humility. But that's not what Adam and Eve did. Instead, they responded by casting blame and justification. We see that Adam blames the woman and the woman blames the serpent. And there's all this justification and blaming going on. And not only did their sin introduce sin into the whole world, and then in order to save humanity, Jesus would choose to give his life so that we could be saved and all sin cleansed from us so that we can be united with God again. But beyond that, even still, there was an additional discipline or judgment that Adam and Eve had placed on them. And I think it was because of their lack of repentance and confession and humility. Uh, we see that the man was told that he would have to work the ground with toil and that the woman would know pain in childbirth. And so I think that we see there the importance of that humility, the confession, and the repentance because God is gracious to forgive. And he gave that space for them to give an answer. Um, and, you know, being king, he didn't have to do that, but he did. And I think that speaks a lot about the goodness of God's character, that he gave them room to re respond before he gave his perfect judgment. And we see that same type of interaction 
again in the book of Job. Um, Job falls short by, um, you know, making some allegations against the Lord and questioning his wisdom and greatness. And that because of that, um, we can see that Job was, I mean, he was weak because he was under trial and then he didn't respond, the, you know, perfectly as, as it is. And so um, what happened was that Job failed to grasp the greatness and majesty and awesome and perfect wisdom of the Lord. So the first thing that God did was he brought Job into a better understanding of himself, a right understanding of who God is. And God did this by asking Job a series of questions. And um, those questions are all in chapter 38 of the book of Job. And I really suggest reading that. It's one of those um, chapters where I would recommend just pausing 30 seconds between each verse to kind of really take in the power and majesty of everything that God is in control of. And when we read through that, we see that in no place in that chapter does God give a reason for Job going through his suffering. Um, God doesn't share about the conversation that took place between him and Satan, and God doesn't offer Job any explanation. But instead, God shows Job that if he understands the greatness of the Lord, those explanations are no longer necessary. Um, God is teaching Job to trust in him, and we know that the Lord disciplines those whom he loves. And we can see, too, in this that in the role of creation and just the sun rising in the morning and setting in, in the evening, that God has a proactive, very active hand in all of creation. And reading through this, it actually highlights the ignorance that we see in the world today with the climate experts saying or proclaiming to know how we should be managing the planet, things we need to do. They talk about blocking out the sun's rays and they have all these plans that the scientists are talking about to protect and save the world. But when you read chapter 38 of Job, you can really see how the wisdom of man is foolishness to what the Lord has and in comparison, it's not, it's not comparable because God is perfect in his wisdom and you can really see the shortfallings of man. And I think it's also interesting to note that the book of Job really is this challenge of Satan trying to um, prove that he could destroy a saving faith. And we see him fail at this task because in the end, Job is restored in his relationship with the Lord and they are able to, um, you know, God restores Job. Job offers a sacrifice to the Lord. He repents and he confesses. And that's another difference between Adam and Eve. With Adam and Eve, the Lord asked him, them questions and they responded with blame and justification. But when the Lord questioned Job, Job replied with humility and repentance and confession and sacrifice. And we see that the way the Lord responds to Job and his confession and repentance and sacrifice is that the Lord restores Job by giving him more than what he started with. And he blessed him with a lot of years of life. And I think that that shows the tenderness and the gentleness of the Lord, that he is merciful and that he's forgiving. And I think that when we see the power of God in chapter 38, it can give us a peace that we don't have to have it all figured out, that the Lord is in control and we can just surrender and have that humility about us to know that we don't have what it takes. We, we can't do it on our own. We need the Lord, but that God's hand is in every little uh, facet of creation in our world, in our lives, on so many levels that it's just amazing. And so now when I read Job and especially chapter 38, where God himself is interacting with humanity and speaking to Job, we can see like and marvel at what God is doing and has done and that he is still active and working today. And um, God is setting the parameters of the sunrise and the sunset and the oceans and the clouds and the atmosphere. God has his hand in it all, and 
I really think that it's an awesome thing to marvel on the majesty of God. And I just think that that's really cool. So, um, I don't know. So basically, God disciplines those he loves. And Job was able to restore his relationship with the Lord through having a correct attitude and knowing his relationship with God. And I think that these stories in the Bible where we can see God directly interacting with mankind is really interesting. When we can see, you know, dialogue between God and Adam and Eve, and we see dialogue between Job and God, and we see dialogue even between Cain, who was a murderer, and God has dialogue between him and Cain. And I think that's especially interesting because Cain was a murderer, yet we still see that God spoke to him and had this conversation about protecting Cain from himself being murdered, even though he himself was a murderer. Um, so I think that's really cool. It shows that God is so merciful and kind and that he just really goes beyond um, to extend his mercies. His mercies are new every morning. And um, yeah, so I love that. So those are uh, precious uh, parts of the Bible to dwell on, study and meditate on. And as always, I love to see your comments and I will see you all tomorrow.